Thank you. I've been on book tour for the last three weeks and managed to acquire an ear infection. So I'm sort of half deaf on one side and a little, little hoarse. I hope that won't interfere with my talk tonight. The, uh, the initial work I did on this quartet of books, I did right here. The Linda Hall Library was a fantastic source when I still lived in Kansas City, where most of you know I grew up and lived till I was about 50. Uh, so many of the fundamental scientific papers in the field of nuclear physics, even some from Germany during the Second World War, were here in physical form, not digitized or on microfilm. You could handle the materials. It was really quite wonderful, and it's a very pleasant place to work. Tonight, I want to talk about the original stages of the development of nuclear weapons. That's the part of the story that I've been asked to tell. And in some ways, it's fundamental to the whole long history that I think is coming to a time of great change now, now that the Cold War is over and we really don't know what to do with our nuclear weapons anymore. <clears throat> but at the beginning, we certainly knew what we were doing. And that's what I want to talk about. Nuclear fission was discovered accidentally in Nazi Germany on December 21st, 1938, nine months before the beginning of the Second World War in Europe. It was a discovery that in the long run would sharply limit national sovereignty and change forever the relationship between nation states. And it came as a complete surprise. The German radio chemists Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann, working at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Physical Chemistry in Dahlem, a suburb of Berlin, were bombarding a solution of uranium nitrate with lukewarm neutrons, transmuting microscopic quantities of the uranium into a brew of substances of differing characteristic radioactivities. The two chemists believed their brew might include new man-made elements heavier than uranium, as well as familiar elements like radium, atomic number 88, one of uranium's natural daughters. Instead of radium, however, Hahn and Strassmann found barium in their irradiated solutions, an element about half as heavy as uranium that they had not expected to find. When Hahn had consulted by mail with their physicist colleague, Lisa Meitner, an Austrian Jew who had fled to exile in Sweden, and when Meitner had consulted with her physicist nephew, Otto Frisch, who came over from Denmark at Christmas time to visit her, it became clear that the unexpected barium was a marker for a new species of nuclear reaction, that in fact, Hahn and Strassmann's neutrons had split the uranium nucleus, element 92, into two nearly equal pieces, one of barium, atomic number 56, and one of krypton, atomic number 36. 56 plus 36 equals 92. And that the new reaction was fiercely exothermic, 10 million times as much energy coming out as the neutrons carried in. Physicists had known for 40 years that enormous energy was locked up in the atom. Here at last was a way to release it. Otto Hahn brooded on the probable military applications and seriously considered suicide. Word spread quickly in the small world community of physicists. Hahn and Strassmann published their results in the German science journal, Naturwissenschaften. Meitner and Frisch told Niels Bohr, the Danish physicist and Nobel laureate, and followed up with confirming physical experiments published in the British journal Nature borrowing a name for the new reaction from the biology of cell division. 
Bohr carried the news to America. Soviet physicists working in Leningrad under young Igor Kurchatov, British physicists, German physicists, the French team at the Radium Institute in Paris, American experimenters from coast to coast rushed to demonstrate fission in their laboratories with off-the-shelf equipment. The discovery, as physicist Philip Morrison would say later, was overripe. A Japanese Army Lieutenant General, who was an electrical engineer, assigned a member of his staff to track it. If Hahn and Strassmann had not discovered fission in Germany, others would have discovered it in some other laboratory, in some other country. Here was no Faustian bargain, as some even all these years later find it comforting to imagine. Here was no evil machinery one or another noble scientist might have hidden from the politicians and the generals. To the contrary, here was a new insight in how the world worked, an energetic reaction older than the Earth that science had finally devised the instruments and arrangements to coax forth. It is a profound and necessary truth, the American theoretical physicist Robert Oppenheimer would say, that the deep things in science are not found because they are useful. They were found because it was possible to find them. The physicists saw immediately what might be done with the new reaction. Hungarian emigre physicist Leo Zillard told his American patron, Louis Straws, on January 25th, 1939, that nuclear energy might be a means of producing power and mentioned atomic bombs. Philip Morrison remembers that when fission was discovered within perhaps a week, there was on the blackboard in Robert Oppenheimer's office at Berkeley, a drawing, a very bad and execrable drawing of a bomb. These possibilities, commented the American theoretical physicist Robert Serber, were immediately obvious to any good physicist. Within months of the German discovery, the Italian physicist and recent Nobel laureate Enrico Fermi would stand at his panoramic office window high in the physics tower at Columbia University looking down the gray winter length of Manhattan Island, alive with vendors and taxis and crowds, cup his hands as if he were holding a ball and say simply, a little Obama like that, and it would all disappear. Why would these men of goodwill, who believe themselves to be members of a peaceful, international community of scientists want to build a weapon of mass destruction. Always and everywhere in that first round of nuclear proliferation, the same reason repeats because possession of such a weapon seemed the only defense against an enemy similarly armed. Deterrence had already been debated publicly and at length during the 1930s in the context of aerial bombardment. It found its first documented expression in the context of nuclear weapons in a secret report prepared early in 1940 as a warning to the British government by two emigre physicists, Otto Frisch again and Rudolf Pierls, that also first laid out on paper the basic design and operation of an atomic bomb. If one works on the assumption, the two physicists wrote, that Germany is or will be in possession of such a weapon, it must be realized that no shelters are available that would be effective and could be used on a large scale. The most effective reply would be a counter threat with a similar bomb. Therefore, it seems to us important to start production 
as soon and as rapidly as possible, even if it is not intended to use the bomb as a means of attack. The world was at war. The new tool of nuclear energy, like all tools, might also serve as a weapon. In the course of the Second World War, every major industrial nation began a program to build atomic bombs. The Germans, the British, the French before their surrender, the Soviets, the Americans, the Japanese. But nuclear weapons development required a massive commitment of government funds, funds that would have to be diverted from the conventional prosecution of the war. If atomic bombs could be built, they would be decisive, in which case no belligerent could afford not to pursue them. But making that judgment depended on two corollary assessments. The first, whether or not such weapons were inventable, whether nature would allow such an explosion to proceed. The second, whether or not the enemy was capable of inventing them in time to affect the outcome of the war. Both assessments depended critically on how much scientists trusted their government and how much governments trusted their scientists. Trust would not be a defining issue later after the secret, the one and only secret that the weapon worked became known. This first time around, however, trust was crucial as the Russian physicist Viktor Adamsky who worked on the Soviet bomb, has pointed out. The tension between the scientists and their governments, Adamsky writes, stemmed from the fact that there existed no a priori certainty of the possibility of creating atomic bombs. And merely for clarification of the matter, it was necessary to get through an interim stage to create a device, the nuclear reactor, in order to perform a controlled chain reaction instead of the explosive kind. But the implementation of this stage required tremendous expense, incomparable to any of those previously spared for the benefit of scientific research. And it was necessary to tell this straight to your government, making it clear that the expenses may turn out to be in vain, an atomic bomb may not result the American nuclear scientists addressed the president directly and described that complicated situation to him. After a number of procrastinations, which are inevitable even in a democratic society, a decision was taken in the USA to make the research as comprehensive as required by logic, disregarding the uncertainty of the final result. There was, and Adamski concludes, no such confidence and mutual understanding in Germany. In the United States, the trust was there, and President Franklin D. Roosevelt duly authorized a full-scale Anglo-American nuclear weapons program on October 9, 1941. In Germany, the trust was not there on either side, and the German program fragmented and stalled. After 1942, Werner Heisenberg, Otto Hahn, Richard von Weizsäcker turned their attention to building a nuclear reactor, and the bomb went by the board. Nor did the German scientists believe the Allies could do what they themselves had not judged feasible. The French program was stillborn. The Soviets, fighting for their lives, against an almost overwhelming German invasion, put their early work on hold, not entirely convinced of its importance, and revived it in 1943 after the Red Army pushed the Wehrmacht back outside Moscow. The Japanese saw a bomb program that was beyond their resources, estimated incorrectly that it was also beyond American resources, and scaled down their efforts to laboratory studies of uranium enrichment. 
The Anglo-Americans knew very little of these developments. Until 1944, they raced against an imaginary German clock, calculating that from the discovery of fission for forward, the Germans might have at least a two-year lead. Then another and more terrible clock ticked off the project's hours. The clock of the war itself, of the young men dying on the battlefields of Europe and Russia and the bloody Pacific beaches. The Germans, the British, the French had used poison gas in the last great war, as they all said, to shorten the war and save lives. Robert Oppenheimer, recruiting scientists for a secret laboratory in New Mexico where the first bombs might be designed and built, whispered that he couldn't tell them what they would be doing, but he could tell them that their work would end the war and save lives. Before Oppenheimer began recruiting, Zillard, Fermi, and their colleagues at Columbia, and then at the University of Chicago, had to accomplish the intermediate step that Adamski mentions. They had to build an experimental nuclear reactor to prove that it was possible to achieve a controlled chain reaction in uranium. This would be a slow neutron chain reaction, multiplying in thousandths of a second and relatively easy to control, not the microsecond fast neutron chain reaction that would proceed in a bomb but fission was the source of energy in both arrangements. The reactor design Zillard and Fermi worked out was an oblate spheroid assembly large as a two-car garage of graphite blocks drilled with blind holes into which would be inserted pucks or slugs of uranium oxide or metal. They needed 700,000 pounds of highly purified graphite all the uranium metal they could get, which turned out to be 12,400 pounds and some 80,000 pounds of oxide. None of these materials could be bought off the shelf. Their manufacture had to be developed and subsidized. The secret of the bomb would turn out to be industrial production on an enormous scale, $2.2 billion worth by the end of the war in 1945 dollars, the equivalent of about $27 billion today. What began as a tabletop experiment on a laboratory bench in Germany in 1938 became in the United States an industry comparable in scale in 1945 to the contemporary US automobile industry. Niels Bohr had gone back to Denmark from the United States in 1939, secure in the conviction that no nation could afford to build such an industry in time of war. The United States not only did so, it did so redundantly, pursuing three different and expensive paths to accumulating the necessary quantities of fissile materials. The Manhattan Project, as the program came to be called, commanded a higher priority for materials and staff than any other program of the war. Not because anyone thought the atomic bomb would win the war, but because its sole possession by an enemy might turn allied victory into defeat. Fermi called his construction a pile because it was made that way by piling up layers of uranium slugged graphite bricks crosswise one on top of the other to achieve a critical mass. The pile would not only prove the chain reaction, it would also be a model cauldron for transmuting uranium into the first man-made element produced in quantity, plutonium, discovered in 1941 and 10 times more fissile than uranium itself. Fermi's pile went critical in a double squash court under the stands of Stagg Field at the University of Chicago on December 2nd, 1942, one year almost to the day after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor that precipitated 
U.S. entry into the Second World War. By January 1943, General Leslie Groves of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had acquired half a million acres of land on the Columbia River near the village of Hanford in eastern Washington state. And there in the next three years, the Army would build a major complex of five-story graphite production reactors and remote controlled plutonium separation plants the size of ocean liners. The huge separation plants were scaled up directly from chemist Glenn Seaborg's microgram quantity work that paralleled Fermi's at the University of Chicago. In the meantime, in Tennessee, General Groves had already begun construction on two other gigantic and futuristic factories. Plutonium chemically different from uranium could be separated chemically from the uranium matrix in which it was bred. But plutonium was a new and unknown element with unknown properties, and Groves had no intention of relying on it alone. Uranium, a metal known since 1789, would make a more conservative bomb. Unfortunately for Groves, ordinary natural uranium, though it could be coaxed into a sustained chain reaction with slow neutrons, as Fermi had shown, didn't chain react with fast neutrons and therefore wasn't suitable for a bomb. Natural uranium is predominantly a mixture of two variant physical forms called isotopes. Only the rarer of the two forms, designated uranium-235, explosively chain reacts. And U-235 is only one part in 140 of natural uranium, seven-tenths of one percent. The rest is U-238. Since the two isotopes are chemically identical, their slight difference in mass was the only difference physicists could exploit to separate them. Of a number of separation systems explored in the early days of the Manhattan Project, two proved promising enough to develop at industrial scale. One involved diffusing gaseous uranium hexafluoride under pressure through a porous barrier. Lighter U-235 diffused slightly faster through the barrier than heavier U-238 by piping off the slightly enriched product and repeating the diffusion several thousand times in a cascade of stages similar to the pipes and towers of an oil refinery, it proved possible to enrich the U-235 portion of natural uranium to above 90%. The gaseous diffusion plant that Groves built at Oak Ridge, Tennessee was a U-shaped structure half a mile long, the most highly automated installation of its day. The other separation system was even more prodigal. It involved vaporizing natural uranium in a vacuum and pulling the resulting ionized gas through a powerful magnetic field, separating natural uranium into its component isotopes atom by atom. The lighter U-235 would follow a tighter arc through the magnetic field than the heavier U-238, and collector buckets around the bend could catch the partly separated sputter. The machines built at Oak Ridge drew enough electricity to light a city, but the process was relatively efficient. During the war, gaseous diffusion and electromagnetic isotope separation worked in harness, enriched product from one system feeding into the other. By the summer of 1945, these gigantic factories had produced only some 50 kilograms of weapons-grade U-235, enough for one conservatively designed bomb. Army intelligence agents carried the monthly Oak Ridge output to Oppenheimer's secret laboratory in New Mexico in a briefcase by public train. Plutonium from Hanford convoyed to New Mexico 
and an ordinary army ambulance. Both materials in their purified form are only lightly radioactive. Contrary to popular opinion, I might add. <clears throat> As there were two kinds of nuclear materials, so were there two kinds of bomb. <coughs> the, <coughs> excuse me. The, <coughs> the more conservative design, nicknamed Little Boy, was a six-foot cannon with a rod of highly enriched uranium fitted into the muzzle that would mate with a cylinder of the same material fired up the barrel at the appropriate time like an artillery shell. When the two parts mated, they would form a supercritical mass and explode. The gun type bomb was grossly inefficient, but experiments with diluted uranium confirmed that it was reliable, so much so that it was certified for use without proof testing at full yield. In any case, there wasn't enough U-235 for a test. The first little boy built was the one that was used. Los Alamos, Oppenheimer's secret laboratory on a mesa northwest of Santa Fe, discovered to its horror in the summer of 1944 that impurities in reactor bred plutonium made the material so unstable that a piece fired up a cannon barrel even at 3,000 feet per second would predetonate, starting to fission and melting down before it had time to mate and explode. Oppenheimer ordered a massive shift in the laboratory's priorities to develop an alternative method of assembling a critical mass. A spherical assembly of 32 shaped charges of explosives, each charged with its own newly invented exploding wire detonator, ignited with a simultaneity of one millionth of a second, would reverse a detonation wave diverging outward from a point into a detonation wave converging inward on a point, a method the scientists named implosion. The inwardly converging shock wave <clears throat> would squeeze a subcritical mass of plutonium at the center of the assembly to more than twice its normal density, rendering it supercritical and initiating a chain reaction too rapidly for predetonation. The laboratory worked night and day, six and seven days a week for the rest of 1944 and the first half of 1945 to develop the exotic new technology. It was sufficiently unreliable even then to require a full-scale test. The test in the desert northwest of Alamogordo, New Mexico, counted down to zero just before dawn on July 16, 1945. The first full-scale, man-made, fast neutron chain reaction exploded with a force equivalent to about 18,000 pounds of TNT. That should be 18,000 tons of TNT, actually. <laughs> A great fireball lighting up the night, thrusting into the pristine desert air on a stem of roiling gas and smoke. No one who saw it could forget it, said the director of the test, Kenneth Bainbridge, a foul and awesome display. That same morning, the destroyer Indianapolis steamed out of San Francisco Bay, carrying Little Boy and its uranium bullet, bound for Tinian Island in the Marianas, where the B-29s that would carry the weapons to Japan had staged out in June and July. Little Boy's target assembly followed by air on July 26. So did two high explosive assemblies for plutonium bombs, the spherical implosion weapon nicknamed Fat Man to be used after Little Boy, and the second Fat Man for which a plutonium core would be ready on August 12th. More atomic bombs would be ready if needed, Oppenheimer projected in late July. As he wrote General Groves, 
from possibly three in September to, we hope, seven or more in December. President Harry Truman was waiting eagerly at the Potsdam Conference for word of a successful test. It bucked him up. The Soviet Union was still officially neutral in the Pacific War. Stalin had promised to begin fighting the Japanese on August 15th. And until the news came of the successful New Mexican test, Truman's major concern had been to shore up Stalin's commitment. The test changed the stakes. Now Truman wanted to end the war before the Russians joined it, to exclude them from the victory and a share of the spoils. Believe Japs will fold up, he confided to his diary, before Russia comes in. I am sure they will when Manhattan appears over their homeland. General George Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff, whose judgment everyone respected, remembered later why there was not more discussion in those final days of summer about demonstrating or pocketing the bomb. We regarded the matter of dropping the atomic bomb as exceedingly important, Marshall said. We had just gone through a bitter experience at Okinawa, the last major island campaign, when the United States lost more than 12,500 men killed and lost, killed and missing, and Japan more than 100,000 killed in 82 grim days of fighting. Marshall continued, this has been preceded, this had been preceded by a number of similar experiences in other Pacific islands north of Australia. The Japanese had demonstrated in each case that they would not surrender and would fight to the death. It was expected that resistance in Japan with their home ties would be even more severe. We had had the 100,000 people killed in Tokyo in one night of conventional firebombs, and it had had seemingly no effect whatsoever. It destroyed the Japanese cities, yes, but their morale was not affected as far as we could tell, not at all. So it seemed quite necessary, if we could, to shock them into action. We had to end the war, Marshall concludes. We had to save American lives. And in truth, the at first atomic bombs would not be even a quantitative extension of the destruction that strategic bombing had already wreaked on the cities of Japan. Since late April, Curtis LeMay's B-29s had been systematically firebombing Japanese cities one by one to utter destruction, killing hundreds of thousands of civilians in the process. By August 1st, the B-29s were burning down cities of less than 50,000 population, almost the only cities left in Japan to burn. Hiroshima and Nagasaki survived to be atomic bombed only because they had been deliberately reserved. <clears throat> the devastation of Hiroshima on August 6th was complete. Little boy yielded 15 kilotons. Of 76,000 buildings in the city, 70,000 were damaged or destroyed, 48,000 totally. 90% of all Hiroshima medical personnel were killed or disabled. Up to September 1st, at least 70,000 people died. More died later of the effects of burns and radiation. George Marshall remembered that he was surprised and shocked that the Japanese didn't immediately sue for peace. What we did not take into account, he said, was that the destruction would be so complete that it would be an appreciable time before the actual facts of the case would get to Tokyo. There was no communication for at least a day, I think, and maybe longer. <clears throat> the Air Force dropped millions of leaflets onto Japanese cities <clears throat> in the next several days, suggesting that skeptics, quote, make inquiry as to what happened to Hiroshima and asking the Japanese people to petition the emperor to end the war. Conventional bombing continued as well. But there was now a struggle for power in the Japanese government. 
No surrender emerged. And on August 9th, Fat Man exploded over Nagasaki with a 22 kiloton yield, killing at least another 40,000 people and devastating another Japanese city. On August 8th, the Soviet Union had invaded Manchuria in full force and was rapidly descending the Kurile Islands toward Hokkaido, evident, evidently a greater pressure on the Japanese government than the atomic bombings. Finally, breaking long tradition, Emperor Hirohito demanded that the government communicate its surrender, and reluctantly it did. In his historic broadcast to his people on August 15, Hirohito specifically cited quote, a new and most cruel bomb, the power of which to do damage is indeed incalculable, taking the, toil, the toll of many innocent lives as the reason why we have ordered the acceptance of the provisions of the joint declaration of the powers. The atomic bombs that exploded over Hiroshima and Nagasaki didn't win the Pacific War but they contributed to its early end. What might have followed had the war continued, no one can say with certainty, except that Hiroshima and Nagasaki would certainly have been firebombed, probably to equivalent loss of life. The Soviet Union would have occupied Hokkaido and perhaps the northern half of Honshu. Having done so, Stalin would certainly have insisted on a larger share of the spoils. Japan might have been partitioned as Korea and Germany were partitioned. Was it necessary to drop the bombs? Were they weapons of mass destruction? Was their use a crime against humanity? I think such questions as these beg the real question, which is why war became so much more destructive in the first half of the 20th century than ever before in the history of our species. It did so, I believe, because efficient killing technologies made the traditional exercise of national sovereignty pathological. According to the United States Strategic Bombing Survey, quote, the number of civilian deaths in Japan greatly exceeded the number of strictly military deaths inflicted on the Japanese in combat by the armed forces of the United States. This statement is so pregnant with significance, for if there sh still be doubt that the emphasis in warfare has shifted from military forces to the civilian population, then this fact should dissipate all uncertainty. With disease, blockade, famine, and fire, it had sometimes been possible to kill large numbers of people in the past. The 20th century arsenal of automatic weapons, massed artillery, poison gas, high explosives, and firebombing made such slaughter more certain and more efficient, made it industrial, mass produced it, so that the number of deaths became a direct function of time and resources invested in the work death cranked out like sausages or cars. The atomic bomb was the culmination of that process, a mechanism that visited total death upon its targets cheaply, indiscriminately, and almost instantaneously. Whether or not people died at Hiroshima or Nagasaki depended not on their identities, whether combatants or non-combatants, Korean forced laborers, American prisoners of war, pregnant women, children, grandmothers, newborn babies, or Shinto priests, but merely on the accident of their distance from ground zero. The closing days of the Second World War mark a turning point in human history, the point of entry into a new era when humankind, for the first time, acquired the means of its own destruction. Niels Bohr liked to say that the goal of science is not universal truth. Rather, Bohr thought the modest but relentless goal of science is what he called the gradual removal of prejudices. The discovery that the earth revolves around the sun removed the prejudice 
that the Earth is the center of the universe. The discovery of microbes removed the prejudice that disease is a punishment from God. The discovery of evolution removed the prejudice that Homo sapiens is a separate and special creation. And the discovery of how to release nuclear energy and its application to build weapons of mass destruction is gradually removing the prejudice on which war itself is based. The insupportable conviction that there is a limited amount of energy available in the world to concentrate into explosives, that it is possible to accumulate more of such energy than one's enemies, and thereby militarily to prevail. So cheap, so portable, so holocaustal did nuclear weapons eventually become that even nation states as belligerent as the United States and the Soviet Union preferred to sacrifice a portion of their national sovereignty, preferred to forego the power to make total war rather than be destroyed in their fury. Lesser conflicts continue and will continue until the world community is sufficiently impressed with the destructive futility to forge new instruments of protection and new systems of international law. But world-scale war, at least, has been revealed to be historical, not universal. A manifestation of destructive technologies of limited scale. In the long history of human slaughter, that is no small achievement. These are hard truths, but total war is harder. As the Polish mathematician and Los Alamos denizen Stan Ulam commented in his autobiography, it is still an unending source of surprise for me to see how a few scribbles on a blackboard or on a sheet of paper could change the course of human affairs. Thank you. If you have a question, I'll bring the microphone around. I'm curious to know how old you were when the bomb dropped and what, what inspired you to write about the atomic bomb. That was certainly one of the things that did inspire me. I was eight years old in 1945. The whole of my childhood had really been the Second World War. One of my earliest memories is going from house to house in my neighborhood in Kansas City, knocking on doors and saying, with no real understanding of what it meant, but it really stirred up the adults in the house, the Japs bomb Pearl Harbor. So for me, when I opened Life magazine in the mid-August issue and saw the photograph of the mushroom cloud over Hiroshima, I understood even at eight that something very different had happened and began to be interested at that time in science. Life magazine, as some of you will recall, was full of wonderful illustrated articles about basic physics, nuclear physics, pictures of atoms, and so forth. And I began to get a sense of how science was involved in all of that. But that stayed with me for a long time. And in the mid-1970s, when I was basically a novelist, writing for magazines to support myself, since my novels didn't, uh, I, I applied for a Guggenheim Fellowship to write a novel that would be set at Los Alamos during the Second World War. It's the only book I've ever attempted to write that just never worked. I mean, I finished it, but my publisher rejected it, sadly, and I had to find some other way to fulfill that commitment. But I realized that the reason that I couldn't make it work is because the story itself was so deep and so rich. 200 of the most interesting people of the 20th century, all of these changes in the world and the war and the physics and so on, that the way to tell the story was to tell it straight. And I was very lucky because the 
fundamental documents from Los Alamos and other places had just about that time been declassified for the first time. So I didn't have to write through interviews, but could in many cases look at the original sources. So many things came together. It was also in the early 80s, President Reagan had been elected. He was making major threats to the Soviet Union. And as I've discovered since, and as you can read in my last two books on the subject, Soviets came very close to feeling that we were going to attack them. And in 1983, in the autumn of 83, very, we were within a few hours of a Soviet first strike. When President Reagan found out, he was horrified. His rhetoric wasn't intended to incite the enemy to actually attack us. And it was at the end of that month when he spoke to the Japanese Diet on December, I think, 23rd or so, 1983, that he said for the first time, a nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. So it was in that milieu as well that I was working on this book here, here in this library, and very much aware that it looked like things were coming to the point where we could easily have a nuclear exchange between the two countries with the, fundamentally the destruction of the human world. Yes? Iran, yes, I knew we'd ask that question and left it out deliberately. So the question is, what about what's going on in Iran? You know, every time another country has decided to, I will, first of all, I think Iran is doing the bomb in the basement scheme that Israel did. They're working slowly toward developing nuclear weapons, building up the infrastructure that I described that we built during the war. Uh, and then they're going to have the option to go either way. And that's basically it was Israel's program for a long time. And of course still is in terms of not officially acknowledging that they have nuclear weapons. But every time another country goes nuclear, go back to China in the late 60s, we have always, our official rhetoric has been, they're crazy, we can't trust them, if they get nuclear weapons, they'll give them to terrorists and so forth. What actually happens again and again is that the country that develops a few nuclear weapons discovers it's in even worse peril than it was before in the sense that it now becomes a threat to every other nuclear power in the world, not simply whatever countries it was squabbling with. So I think that's probably one of the reasons the Iranians seem to be moving so cautiously. There is a sense, as there very clearly is with North Korea, that they would like to use this, this very powerful possession, if and when they acquire it, as a negotiating tool, which was until the Bush administration in the early 21st century basically told them we weren't going to negotiate with them, was the way they were proceeding. Then they went quickly for a small arsenal that they really don't have any means to deliver. So I'm less threatened by the idea that Iran might be working on a weapon. The question that always comes up next is, but won't they give them to terrorists who are not deterred by the threat of, of nuclear attack? And I think the answer to that, to me, is basically clear. No country has ever given nuclear weapons to any other entity for, I think, two reasons. One, they put themselves at risk if that other entity uses those weapons of being attacked in their turn. And two, they don't know whether that other entity might use those weapons against them or use those weapons to threaten them. So I don't see Iran, like any other country in the last 70 years, giving nuclear weapons away knowing that at least Israel, if not the United States, would basically pave the country <laughs> if there was any threat at all. It might happen anyway, as we know. Okay. I'm a friend of the library. I have one question sure. for you, if you don't mind, sure. Mr. Rose. In the event all nations that contain, that have possession of, and might use some degree of nuclear weaponry, such as the United States, Russia, China, Iran, Japan, etc., <laughs> Supposing they all decide to use it all at once, no hesitation, no thought, mm -hmm. no conscience, no regard for humanity, no regard for each other, what would be a term to describe this type of situation? Well, you know, I always call that nuclear holocaust, and I think the term is appropriate there. The word holocaust has a special meaning today, referring to the destruction of the Jews during the Second World War, and that 
refers to the deliberate annihilation of almost an entire people. And I think the word is appropriate in the context of, uh, you know, it wouldn't take that many countries. The scientists who developed the concept of nuclear winter back in the 1980s recently reviewed their work using the much more sophisticated climate models that have been developed in the intervening years to look at global warming and climate change. And they found first that a full-scale exchange of the sort you're describing would uh, be even worse than they had expected before, that we would have temperature drops, average annual temperature drops of 10 to 20 degrees for 20 or 30 years, enough basically to starve out the world. But then they thought, I wonder what a little nuclear war would look like. Suppose India and Pakistan, each using 50 Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapons, which are almost considered tactical nuclear weapons today, very small yield compared to what we have. Suppose they exchange 50 bombs from each side on their cities, which they would do, with all of the combustible materials in cities. They charted it, and I have a, a, an animated graph that you can find online if you're interested. And it shows a pall of smoke slowly over the next three months from just that little regional attack, which you would think wouldn't affect us, spreading around the entire world from Antarctica to the Arctic and everywhere in between, dropping world temperatures by two or three degrees annually, which is not enough to cause full-scale nuclear winter, but which would be enough to reduce the temperatures in summer in temperate zones to hard freezes in July, something like that famous year of 1816, which was called the year without a summer, when millions of people starved to death because they, their crops failed. So even a small regional nuclear war using the equivalent of one and a half megatons of explosive force, but on cities where fire would be the primary effect, would be enough to kill, they estimated, 20 million people promptly from the attack but two billion people who live marginally on their food supplies now around the world. So this is an issue for all of us. This isn't an issue that's just related to things in the Middle East or things in, 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 the, in South Asia. We're still all very much involved in this. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, thank yes. you for joining us again. I believe it was three, four years ago. You came to town with your arsenal of folly. I'm Henry Stover with PeaceWorks. Do you intend to continue this series and include Kansas City as a place that makes 85% of the parts of a nuclear yeah. weapon at the Kansas City plant? And this book does not mention, I believe, the 1968 Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. Oh, yeah, it does. Oh, it does, okay. Well, it's in a previous book, so this deals with the uh, the reaffirmation of that treaty in 95. And I have heard that there may be a possibility of 120 nations that do not have nuclear weapons that may take a strong stance demanding that those countries that have nuclear weapons must get rid of them. Is there any truth to that? You know, when the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty was signed in 1970, there were many countries in the so-called South, particularly India, that were concerned that the nuclear powers, although they'd pledged to work toward eliminating their nuclear arsenals, weren't really taking that pledge seriously. So they made a proviso in the treaty that unlike most treaties, which are automatically uh, indeterminate in, in extension, basically continue throughout time, that's the way they're written, that this treaty would have an up or down vote on whether it should be made permanent or not 25 years after then. So that was 1995. And at that time, that vote was taken. And as you'll read in this, la this new book, Arsenal, Twilight of the Bombs, uh, someone who's become a good friend of mine, an American ambassador named Thomas Graham, personally went to 65 countries and talked to them about the importance of permanently extending the NPT. And he was able to convince enough countries that it was extended permanently. But then, as previously, at other meetings of the, the signatories of this treaty, provisos were added to the treaty demanding that the nuclear powers stop, stop basically bluffing on this issue and do something serious about nuclear disarmament. 
It's partly for that reason that President Obama has declared it the official policy of our government to work toward eliminating all nuclear weapons in the world. And the first steps that he has proposed include getting control of all the nuclear materials that are still under less than perfect security around the world, particularly in the former Soviet Union. Sam Nunn, the former senator, estimates that about 60% of all the nuclear materials in the world are now under safe lock and key, the kind of elaborate real-time accounting systems that the United States uses. But that still leaves quite a lot that isn't quite that secure. So we're still working on that, we're still spending money on that. Beyond that is the task of reducing nuclear arsenals until we get down to the point where we're all ready to agree to eliminate them entirely. At that time, we will have much more sophisticated and elaborate inspection systems even than we do now, and we have pretty good systems in place already. Then, of course, the next thought is, what if someone cheats? And I, I bring this up because it's a perfectly realistic concern about any treaty. Uh, Ambassador Richard Butler of Australia, who was one of the people I talked to at length about this book, uh, and was involved in developing this idea of going to zero, says, look, nobody expects 100% compliance with a treaty. I said, well, then how is it possible for us to all agree to trust each other enough to eliminate all our arsenals? And the answer is, he said, the whole world would come down upon a country that started to rebuild its nuclear capability. And he's right about that. But there's another, there's another barrier behind that that I think you should think about. When you speak about the elimination of nuclear weapons, it sounds, it sounds all very idealistic and utopian. In fact, there would be practical reasons for everybody to accept this, but if someone decided to try to reconstitute their arsenal on the assumption that we have adequate systems to detect they're doing so, and I'm quite sure we will, we do really now, it's always, possible first to try to negotiate with such a cheater and second to have a conventional war in which all the rest of the world would take part. I mean, you can think of our first war in Iraq as uh, the first attempt to, to, to reduce, to eliminate a country's nuclear infrastructure that was done unwillingly in terms of the Iraqis, but successfully from, our, from the rest of the world's point of view. But if all else fails, and the country that was cheating refused to stop, then the countries that previously had nuclear weapons could always begin in turn to reconstitute their arsenals. And that at worst would only return us to where we are now. So I don't think of the elimination of all nuclear weapons as they're gone forever. I think of it as a kind of delayed deterrence where it's going to take six months rather than 30 minutes to respond to a potential attack. As long as the response is certain, as long as the reconstituted arsenal is secure, deterrence six months later is just as effective as deterrence in 30 minutes, and a lot safer in terms of finding other ways to solve the problem. Okay, last question, please. We now have a huge arsenal of atomic bombs. Yet, here in Kansas City, we're building a new factory that's <coughs> going to make atomic parts. Yes. Why are we doing this? You know, one of the real drivers of the Cold War was domestic politics on our side and on the Soviet side. And it was primarily a struggle between the democratic right, I'm sorry, the Republican right and the democratic left over who was stronger on defense. It was always possible to attack a candidate by saying he wasn't, it wasn't exclusive to the Republican side either. John Kennedy was partly elected on the grounds that we had a missile gap, some of you will recall, which he discovered the day after he was inaugurated didn't exist. And that's the kind of game that has been played far too often within our domestic political campaigns that has encouraged the maintaining and developing of nu nuclear weapons. So now here we are today 
President Obama has officially declared the gradual elimination of nuclear weapons as our government policy, but he has to deal with the Republicans in Congress. To take one example, Senator John Kyle, who managed to defeat the nuclear uh, test ban treaty in 1999, when it came up for Senate ratification uh, during Bill Clinton's administration, is the primary person who's pressing Obama to invest as much as 80 to $100 billion to so-called modernize our whole nuclear weapons production infrastructure. I don't know whether it's worth it at the price or not, but there has always been that kind of trade-off between those who believe in more weapons and those who believed in less and fewer weapons. And how you get around that, I don't know. But it's pretty clear that that's Senator Kyle's price for signing the latest version of the treaty that's going to be up for, for uh, Senate ratification in the next year. So you balance it back and forth. It's, I mean, if we build the, the complex, it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to build more weapons. It just means we will have thrown another 80, 90 billion dollars down the rat hole. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. And thank you for attending tonight's lecture. Uh, Mr. Rose will be signing copies of his new book, Twilight of the Bomb, courtesy of Rainy Day Books. And please join us next week, Wednesday, October 20th, with Dwight Williams from the US Department of Energy speaking about the new face of nuclear research. And also tomorrow at noon in the auditorium, we'll have a presentation on the Brush Creek Development Project, part of our new Science Matters lecture series. Thank you and good night.